All right, so today's lecture is going to be on our, the first of our many um, advanced lectures. Not many. I think we have only something like five or six lectures left. Um, but we're going to start our advanced unit. And the topics in this unit are kind of in flux. So the ones I put up on the course website, um, I plan to talk about most of them, but I may switch, I may change my mind, and especially if people express interest towards hearing one thing or another. Towards the end, I may kind of switch up what, we, what I actually end up talking about. But there are a few, a few advanced topics that I think are absolutely crucial to learn, and this is one of them. This in, in court and descent. I would, not, uh, no, I would not bargain to remove those at all. So um, dual methods are a nice uh, class of methods that approach um, minimization from the dual, but do so in a kind of an implicit way. So it ties in nicely to what we learned about duality, but it actually the the perspective that we're thinking about is one in which we don't actually even know the dual. Maybe we don't know the conjugate function of the loss. It's OK. We can, we can see that we can still get away with something like dual gradient ascent. And that leads directly into ADMM. And I'll say more, a bit more about ADMM uh, as we get there. But just to provide a bit of motivation, ADMM is probably one of the more widely used algorithms today in statistics and machine learning. It's very flexible. And uh, it's an old algorithm. It's not a new idea. But in 2010, Steve Boyd and some of his students wrote a review paper that really ignited uh, interest in ADMM. And they just kind of reminded researchers, hey, you know, there's this, uh, this old idea that appears to work well. We should, we should be considering it as one of the kind of main tools. So we're going to see that, in fact, ADMM provides an extremely simple algorithm for both the fuse lasso and the group lasso. And indeed, the group fuse lasso as well. That's going to be on your homework. But we'll cover this fuse lasso and the group lasso today. These things are remarkably simple uh, compared to what we did the last two lectures where we kind of saw that we had to you know, go through maybe some fancy interior point methods to solve them, or proximal operators that were not totally trivial, et cetera. All right, so let's, um, let's just remind ourselves what these two problem forms were, because we'll be revisiting them at the end of this lecture. The fuse lasso is one of the special problems we studied last time, which is a problem where we have a smooth loss function and an L1 penalty on a vector times the optimization variable beta. Um, sorry, a matrix times my optimization variable beta. That matrix we're calling D. So it's a linear transform of beta. And then we take the L1 norm of that. And the specific linear transform we're interested in the fuse lasso is one that gives us differences between components of beta. So each row of D has a minus 1 and a 1. And so multiplying um, beta by the matrix D gives us differences of beta among some components. And we saw that like, we could interpret that as differences over a graph. Okay, so if you have a particular graph, D would be defined with respect to that graph. It could be a 1D graph, a 1D chain graph, where we get pairwise differences of adjacent components, a 2D grid, where we get um, you know, differences of other components, et cetera. Those are fused lasso problems. Group lasso problems were a different class of problems, so they kind of fit into this general sum of norms framework that we studied, where it's also linear operator times beta. And we actually take the two norm of that rather than the one norm. And there's a bunch of linear operators times beta. And we sum those up. And each linear operator just pulls out a particular subblock of beta. So this beta j is just beta over some subblock of its components. And unlike the fuse lasso, which tries to aim at giving us a piecewise constant vector in some sense over, you know, with respect to some structure defined by d, this guy is trying to give us a block sparse vector. So it's going to give us a solution where blocks of beta defined by these, uh, these indices, um, round bracket j, are either 0 or non-zero altogether. So it's a generalization of the lasso to groups. Okay, so we saw those in, uh, in some amount of detail the last two lectures. OK, let's remind ourselves about conjugate functions, because that's going to be the jumping point for our dual algorithms. Um, we learned uh, across a few lectures that if you give me any function f, I can define its con conjugate function. We sometimes even call it the convex conjugate function, because this function is always convex. That was one special property. Remember that if f was any function, convex or not, its conjugate f star is convex. And it's defined by the maximum discrepancy over all x between a linear function um, in x and f of x itself. And which linear function? It's a linear function where the slope, so to speak, is given by the point at which we're trying to evaluate the conjugate. Okay, so f star at the point y is the maximum discrepancy between y transpose x and f of x over all x. That was the conjugate. 
We saw that they appear frequently in dual problems, so it's very naturally tied to duality, because I can just rewrite this very simply right, by taking a, a negative of, of, of both sides, and I get the negative conjugate of uh, f at the point y is equal to, and I'm going to propagate the negative through this maximum, so now it becomes a minimum over all x of f of x minus y transpose x. So that's just right from the definition. And take a look at this expression here. This looks like a piece of the Lagrangian, right? To form the, the Lagrangian for a dual problem, if we had a linear constraint or an, a linear inequality constraint or something on x, then, and we in introduced a dual variable y, then this looks like it would be a piece of the Lagrangian that we formed. And so to minimize over the primal variables, x, to get the dual, uh, the dual function, we would do something like this, and we'd get out the conjugate. So conjugates are very intimately tied to, um, to dual problems. Okay, and we even saw this relationship, which made the, um, their tie perhaps more concrete. If you have two functions, and this is the primal problem, then the dual problem is given by maximizing the negative conjugate of f star at the dual variable u minus the negative conjugate of g at the dual variable min at, at the argument minus u. We derive this just by introducing an, an equality constraint. So let's the way we derive this is we say that well, I'll just introduce an auxiliary primal variable z. And I'll call this g of z. And I'll introduce a constraint that x is equal to z. Right? There's no reason I, I can't do that. And then I form the Lagrangian with that constraint, and it leads to this dual, just by definition of the conjugate. Okay, so that was another way of seeing that they're related. So what do we know about the conjugate function? We know a few important facts, just to remind you. If f was closed and convex itself, then if I take two conjugates of f, I get back f itself. So f star star is equal to f, provided that f is closed and convex. Also, and this is the, the important fact that we'll be using today, this is um, something that I think appeared on the midterm practice, but maybe not the midterm itself. And I think we had one direction of this in the homework. But we've certainly mentioned this in class before. Um, the, the subgradients of a conjugate function and of the original function are intimately related in the following sense. If I ask you for a subgradient of f star at the point y, then x is a subgradient of f star at the point y, if and only if we flip the roles of y and x, and we look at the, the function itself. If and only if y is a subgradient of f at x. Okay, and this, both of these are equivalent to the last statement, which is that x achieves the minimum if I look at f of z minus y, y transpose z. Okay, so the way to see this last one this is perhaps the most important one, this um, equivalence here for today's lecture, is just to take a subgradient um, with respect to this criterion. Okay, so let, let's suppose that I, we'll just do it here. Let's suppose I told you that I had this problem, minimize over all z, f of z, minus y transpose z, and I told you that x achieved the min x was one of the arguments here, then x must satisfy the following. Um, right, if x is one of the guys that minimize this, then x must satisfy the um, subgrading optimality condition. If I take the subgrading here with respect to z, because of what we know about subgradients and optimality, and that means that if I take the uh, you know, subdifferential of my function f, evaluate it at the point x, and I take the gradient here with respect to z, because this is continuous, uh, differentiable, uh, and I value it at the point x, but that doesn't depend on x, it's just y, that this must, um, this must contain 0. That's subgrading optimality. In other words, I must have y being a subgradient um, of f at the point x. So that establishes this last last equivalence here, right? It's just clear that these two are equivalent from that. OK, so, so let's, let's back up now for a second, because this is going to be important for today. And let's just realize the following fact. If I told you that I wanted a subgradient of the conjugate at the point y, and you didn't know the conjugate, 
You didn't know a closed form for the conjugate. What could you do? You could actually solve this minimization problem. You go back to f. You could form f of z. You could subtract off y transpose z, y being the point at which you want the subgradient. And you can try to minimize that criterion, f of z minus y transpose z. If you do so and you get a point x, then you know that you actually have a subgradient of your uh, conjugate function at the point y. Is that clear to everybody? OK, so just said one more time, I don't need to know the, an explicit form for the conjugate of f in order to find its subgradients. If I can solve this minimization problem, which is only defined in terms of f, then I get away without knowing f star. Furthermore, what happens if um, we can see, let's think about it two ways. What happens if there's only, um, if there's only one subgradient at the point um, y? So there's only one x inside the subdifferential, which means that that would happen if f star was um, differentiable at the point y, right? We can see that that actually implies that there's only one minimizer of this criterion. There's just one minimizer of this criterion. And in fact, with a little more work, we can, we can prove that that means that f must have been st strictly convex, okay, just from the relationship between these two. Conversely, if f is strictly convex, then there's only one minimizer here. And that means there's only one uh, subgradient of f star at the point y, which means that f star must have been differentiable. OK, so in this case, which you can think about it from either direction, we know that if f is strictly convex, say, or if f star is differentiable, then, which are equivalent, then the gradient of f star at the point y, it is the minimizer of f of z minus y transpose z, because that is the only x that is in the subdifferential of f star at the point y. So in other words, th now the, the argument here uniquely determines the gradient. So there's only one option. So we're going to use this fact today. Let me pause for questions. OK, so um, we'll talk about dual gradient methods or subgradient methods, depending on whether or not that the conjugate is differentiable or not. Um, well, then we'll learn a very important um, application of this called dual decomposition. We'll go to augmented Lagrangians, which are in, kind of improved from dual methods in terms of their convergence properties, but they have a shortcoming. Shortcoming mean that they're not decomposable, so they lose that nice feature of, of the usual dual gradient methods. And then we'll move to ADMM, which combines the best of both worlds. It has the good convergence properties of augmented Lagrangians, but has the decomposability of dual methods. Okay, so it's quite a lot to cover. I think we'll be able to get through it all. Uh, if, if not, then I think I'll just spend some time next time talking about ADMM, because it's so important. I don't want to fall short on that. So dual gradient methods, they're they are very simple in principle, and they just come from that observation that we made two slides ago about the, the relationship between the conjugate subgradients and the original function subgradients. And the, the setting is, let's suppose that we can't derive the dual in closed form, but we still want to utilize the dual relationship. I still want to be maximizing the dual problem, although I just don't know what f star is. So it turns out that I can still use a dual-based gradient or subgradient method, depending on whether f star was differentiable or not. And as an example, let's consider the simple problem where I'm going to minimize some function subject to a linear equality constraint, ax is equal to b. Its dual problem is, and this you can check, um, hopefully at this point this thing is, just requires a few lines for you based on your knowledge of conjugates. The dual problem is to maximize overall u minus f star of minus a transpose u minus b transpose u. Just comes from mechanically you know, forming the Lagrangian minimizing it, then recognizing that a part of that is just the negative conjugate. That's all that comes from. So let's suppose I want to actually maximize this problem. I just don't know what f star is. Okay, It turns out we can still do something like dual subgradient ascent or dual gradient ascent. It's an ascent here rather than a descent because we're trying to maximize rather than minimize. 
just by utilizing that relationship. So what we're going to do is we're going to define g to be the function f star composed with the minus a transpose, that, that linear function. So g of u is f star evaluated at minus a transpose u. And we're going to be try to, let's suppose we're going to try to find um, subgradients of g, because we want to perform subgradient ascent here. We want to compute a subgradient and then move in the direction of the subgradient over and over again. And we just recognize from the chain rule that the subgradients of g are a times the subgradients, or minus a rather, times the subgradients of f star evaluated at the point minus a transpose u. Just the chain rule for subgradients when they're composed with linear functions. And now we go back and recall this relationship that we had um, derived two slides ago, which is that a point x is a subgradient of f star at, at y. y here is just minus a transpose u. If and only if x minimizes over all z f of z minus y transpose z. And again, y here is just a trans minus a transpose u. So f of z minus y transpose z is actually just f of z plus u transpose az. So this just comes from that relationship that we derived two slides ago. So every time we want to go to compute a subgradient, let's suppose we actually just run this sub-minimization problem. Let's suppose we can do this. Then we get out an x that, that minimizes that. Does that give us the, the um, subgradient of our criterion? Not quite, right? Because subgradients of our criterion are actually defined by minus a times subgradients of g. So I have to actually take minus a times u, or times this x. And then there's another the part there too. It's the gradient of, of minus b transpose u. It's just that just gives us minus b. So in other words, um, we at every step we compute the uh, the minimum of this uh, internal subproblem, which is f of x minus the current value of y that we're trying to evaluate the subgrading at, which is just a transpose minus a transpose the current value of u. This gives us kind of the key component of the subgrading that we need. And then we just read off the subgrade and the criterion from that, which ends up just being um, minus a times that x minus b. And we move in the direction of the subgrade accordingly. Or sorry, in the direction, yeah, in the direction of the subgrade accordingly. OK, and that's what this is right here, ax minus b. So in other words, this functions as a, as a subgradient of our criterion function um, right here. Just g of u minus g of u minus b transpose u. OK, so I'll just stare at that in a second. Pause if there's questions. So this is nothing else than applying dual subgradient ascent. Well, these are my step sizes. I have these dual variables u. I'm just trying to maximize the dual problem, so I'm moving repeatedly in the direction of the subgradient. But I'm computing the subgradient in a kind of roundabout way, because I don't know f star. And this is how I'm doing it. OK, why have I called this x? Let me pause and ask that question. Why have I called this x? Is that related to the primal variable? Uh, let's suppose I converge. Under idealistic settings, don't worry about whether or not what convergence properties they have. Just assume everything converges. Am I justified at calling this x? Is that actually related to this x up there? Will I get a primal solution? Think about that for a second. So um, what is the relationship between the dual and the primal variables? Well, we can just form the Lagrangian and then look at the stationarity condition. That's how we always find relationships between the dual variables and the primal variables. And so if I, for one, the stationarity condition, or it's really the only part of the stationarity condition, because I only have one primal variable. 
it tells me that if I take a subgrade in respect to x and I set it equal to 0, then that has to be satisfied by my current um, primal and dual variables at optimality. So in other words, um, 0 has to be in the subgrading of f of x plus um, It's even easier just to say, say this, right? At optimality, let's forget about subgradients. At optimality, um, I should have x star minimizes the Lagrangian over all x once I plug in u star. So that'll look like u star transpose ax minus u star transpose b. That just comes from, this just comes from the stationarity condition. Okay, so this is the relationship actually between the primal and dual variables that we're seeking. Okay, so you can kind of forget about this part because this doesn't depend on x. So if x star minimizes this whole thing, then it's just going to minimize this part. So for so what I'm saying, for example, is that if somehow we converge to the dual solution, because we're doing dual subgrading ascent, and we got to the maximizer of our dual criterion, then that x star is also going to be primal optimal uh, in, in some idealistic setting. right? Because it, it, it's going to, by construction, minimize um, f of x plus u transpose ax at the current value of u. So that's why I use that notation for, for this kind of inner key component of the subgradient. So by r running this dual subgradient method, we get out, idealistically, both a dual optimal point and a primal optimal point. OK, if, if f was strictly convex, then from what we know before, f star is differentiable. And that means I can just change uh, the element of argument there to an equals argument. Just, that's just saying that there was only one minimizer of this inner subproblem, f of x plus u transpose ax. And now we know that actually x is functioning as the gradient of the conjugate function evaluated at minus a transpose u. And the whole criterion then becomes differentiable, so it becomes dual gradient ascent. So the, the difference here is that I I might choose the step sizes here in standard ways for subgrading method. Here I would choose the standard ways and the, sub, the step sizes in the standard ways for gradient method. Okay, so I, I could do backtracking here for the step sizes choice. I could also accelerate this. I could apply acceleration because this is at this point this is no more than just gradient ascent. So any of the tricks we learned before apply. I can apply acceleration here. I can do a proximal version of this if I had two parts of the criterion. Again, this is nothing more than, than, sub, uh, than gradient ascent on the dual, except we're just evaluating the gradient in a clever way. So everything we learned about first order methods goes through, goes through here. It's just um, we're writing the gradient in a sneaky way. Okay, so those are, those are dual methods um, for minimizing the primal via the dual when we don't know the conjugate in closed form. So let's, let's uh, talk about just a bit about convergence properties. Um, I'm going to state this property. I'm not going to go through the proof. The proof is on the slide. I think this might have even been a practice problem on the midterm again, maybe this exact one. It turns out that, so we, we saw that if f was strictly convex, then um, f star was differentiable. Right, we argue that directly from this relationship, if f is strictly convex, then this minimizer is unique. So there's only one point in the subgrading of f star, which makes it differentiable. How about one level up? What happens if f is strongly convex? OK, well, that, that implies strictly convex. So we know that at least f is going to be differentiable. So we can write um, grad f star. But if f is strongly convex, then interestingly, it turns out that that implies that the gradient of f star is actually Lipschitz, with its Lipschitz parameter being 1 over the strong convexity parameter of my function. So if f was strongly convex with parameter d, say, then grad f star is Lipschitz with parameter 1 over d. Okay, 
The proof is just really on this slide. It comes right from the definition of those, of what it means to be strongly convex. So let's apply what we know about gradient descent. Then if f was strongly convex with parameter d, then the, my dual gradient ascent method would be run on a function whose gradient is Lipschitz, parameter 1 over d. And we know what convergence looks like for functions that are, whose gradients are Lipschitz. And that means as long as we take the step size less than or equal to 1 over the Lipschitz parameter, remember the Lipschitz parameter was 1 over d, so 1 over 1 over d is just d, as long as we take tk less than or equal to d, then running this dual gradient ascent method is going to converge at the rate 1 over epsilon. To get an epsilon suboptimal estimate, I just need 1 over epsilon on the order of 1 over epsilon iterations. It's applying what we know from first order methods. So we could ask, is that slow or fast compared to what we know about primal gradient descent? When people see this for the first time, I think they think, oh, wow, these dual, these dual gradient methods are terrible. Because here I've assumed, actually, that f is strongly convex. I'm trying to minimize it. And what I get out of it is something whose convergence rate is 1 over epsilon, which is really bad. Because if f was strongly convex and I actually minimized it directly using gradient descent, then I know the convergence rate should be log of 1 over epsilon for strongly convex functions. right? So actually, it turns out this is essentially the same. We're not losing anything by going to the dual. And to see that, we have to, um, we have to kind of put an asterisk next to the stuff that we learned with first order methods. Something that we didn't cover explicitly, but that is a fact, is that if f is strongly convex alone, and it's not differentiable, if I just assume, um, no, I'm sorry. It, it, it's going to need to be differentiable because I'm applying gradient ascent. If f is strongly convex alone, and I didn't tell you its gradient was Lipschitz. I just told you that it was strongly convex. Remember that those are two different properties. Strong convexity, in a sense, is a, if you think about functions with two derivatives, strong convexity, of course, gives us a lower bound on the Hessian. And Lipschitzness gives us an upper bound on the Hessian. OK, so this is the strong convexity part of f. Recall, and this is the Lipschitz-ness of grad f. So when we went to prove results for gradient ascent, we assumed in the most favorable case that both of these were true. I, the function was strongly convex, but also um, its gradient was Lipschitz. And that's when we got, so together, these give an order log 1 over epsilon rate for gradient descent. I don't remember if we did the proof of that, but it's in the, the proof, for example, is in the Boyd and Vandenberg book. It's not a hard proof. Strong convexity alone, this is a fact that we didn't state yet, without having a Lipschitz gradient, only gives an order 1 over epsilon rate. So strong convexity alone is not good enough. We need both of them to ensure this fast rate. And so if all we assume that f is that f was strongly convex, then Gradient ascent on the primal directly would get this rate. We just saw that if we did gradient ascent on the dual via this method, we'd also get that rate. So we're not losing anything. They are the same rate under the same assumptions. Okay, so they're really they're essentially equivalent in terms of their convergence speed. And furthermore, if you assume that the gradient of f is Lipschitz as well as f was strongly convex, then you know that primal gradient descent gives you this fast rate. You could ask, well, what does the dual gradient method give me? Do I still get this log of 1 over epsilon rate? Turns out the answer is actually yes, you do. It's because the converse of this statement is also true. So if f had a Lipschitz gradient, that implies that f star is strongly convex with strong convexity parameter 1 over um, the Lipschitz parameter. So basically, 
Each one of these in turn applies the reciprocal property on F star. So if I assume that F is strongly convex, that means that grad F star is Lipschitz. If I assume that grad F is Lipschitz, that's, that implies that F star is strongly convex. And so if I assume both on F, then I get both on F star, and I also get the log of 1 over epsilon rate. So in both instances, the dual gradient method converges at the same rate as, as primal gradient method. Okay, so that, that just should convince you that we're not losing anything by going to the dual here. Questions about that? Okay, let, let's go through an application that I think is going to, so you might ask why. Why do we do this, right? It doesn't seem that convenient. I have to solve this inner minimization problem. This guy or this guy. Why is that so great? Okay, so here, here is an example of why this is helpful. Dual decomposition. So let's suppose I give you this problem. I want you to minimize a sum of functions across blocks subject to the, inequal the equality constraint x equals b. So it's just a special case of the problem we saw before, but I've told you now that x divides up into, say, b blocks, sub blocks, and so does f. f is actually a function that is additive across those blocks. So f of x is equal to the sum of fi of xi. If I gave you this problem to minimize in the primal, then you, you might be kind of excited if you saw that if I had a large problem, the criterion splits up across smaller blocks. But then you would look at the equality constraint and you'd say, shoot, that kind of ties everything together. Right? It complicates this decomposability. I can't really break this up into B separate minimizations because of this equality constraint. It, it, it kind of messes with my decomposability. <clears throat> Fortunately, or fortuitously, the dual actually decomposes. That's why we like to think about dual methods in this case. So to see that, let's just first divide up A into B blocks as well on a column column-wise basis. So I'm going to divide up A, the columns of A, analogously to how x was divided up. So if x1 was the first 10 components of x, then a1 is the first 10 columns of A, and so forth. So what, what we just realized is that if we were to run dual decomposition on this problem, which is just given by, the only step that's really hard is given by minimizing uh, f of x plus u transpose ax, and that gives us our new update x in the primal, and from that we form our new uh, gradient or subgradient in the dual by ax minus b. This kind of inner subproblem itself decomposes. And to see that, we just have to realize that u transpose, it's a very simple observation, um, if I look at, for example, if a is a1 through AB, and X is equal to X1 to XB, then if I take the matrix vector product AX, that splits up into a linear combination of these sub-blocks of columns. Okay, draw yourself a picture and you'll see that that's indeed the case. So that means that if I were to be looking at minimizing, let's say, minimize overall x, f of x plus u transpose ax, and I remember that f splits up into sums of sub-blocks of functions, and I remember that actually so does ax, splits up across the same blocks, I get u transpose ai xi, sum over i, sum over i. Then look, this entire minimization decomposes across i. I can just minimize each, each sub-block of variables xi independently. Minimize over xi, that's the key, it's not x, xi, just fi of xi plus u transpose ai of xi for each block separately. So this is called dual decompo decomposability. So let's think about this at a high, higher level. What is the, the dual, let's say in this case, subgradient ascent do? Or it would be gradient ascent if these fi's were um, strictly convex. 
we're going to repeat the following steps over and over again. First is, instead of minimizing this guy, we're going to perform B separate minimizations to get our best guess at the primal variable. And we can do those in parallel. There's no reason to have to do those um, all together. Okay, so we're going to minimize this sub, sub chunk of f, fi of xi, plus our current u, transpose ai times xi separately for each i. Then we're going to collect all those answers. We're going to form one master subgradient, or gradient, if the function so were strictly convex, by taking ax minus b. ax is just the sum of ai xi. And we'll make a dual uh, gradient step, or subgradient step. So we can think of these steps in, uh, at a high level as broadcast and gather steps. So suppose I have some central processor, and that stores my dual variable. Okay, and at every step, what this processor has to do, the central node has to do, it has to send out to each of my B um, nodes that I'm going to be running in parallel, has to send out the current dual variable. So it's going to, it's going to broadcast U to all the nodes. Then each node, given that dual variable, it can perform its own minimization. It's going to perform just this. Minimize Fi of Xi plus U transpose Ai times Xi separately for each of these nodes. There's B of them here. Each one corresponds to a particular subblock Xi. Once they're finished, they each send back just a subblock of the primal variables. So this guy sends back x1, this guy sends back x2, this guy sends back x3, etc. And then the central node, it collects all of those. It forms the matrix product ai xi. It subtracts off b after I sum up ai xi. And it makes it a, a dual step. Okay, and then it has a new u, and it sends them back out to all my processors. They all perform their, all, their own primal um, sub-optimizations over some part of the variables and repeat over and over again. Okay, so we've just decomposed a problem in the dual that was actually kind of inexorably tied together in the primal, some, in some way that we couldn't quite separate it, separate out each chunk of variables. So there's, um, there's a possibility to extend this to really any form of uh, constraints. For example, we can handle inequality constraints as well. I just was showing you a, a case with equality constraints for simplicity. But uh, in this case, so suppose I gave you this problem. And instead of an equals b, I had a less than or equal to b. You would go through the same motions, but you would just realize that the dual variable is constrained to be positive. Because the dual variable that corresponds to this problem is going to have, right, its domain is going to just be the positive orthant. So instead of doing, let's say, dual gradient ascent, I have to do projected dual gradient ascent. So I take a dual step. And then I make sure that my dual variables are all positive, because that's a constraint in the dual problem. So that's all I'm going to do here. I'm going to basically perform the same steps as before, where now I'm just going to call the, this temporary variable v, temporary update variable v. And then to get the actual dual variable, I'm just going to make sure that I, I project back onto the positive orthant. So it's projected dual gradient ascent, for example all these functions are strictly convex. And the projection of the positive orthon is extremely simple. I just, if anything's less than 0 in any component, I just call it 0. That's, that's all I'm doing. So if, right, it's something like this. If I want to project onto the positive orthon, and I give you this point, you just take the, in this case, I just would declare the second component to be 0. It's a very simple projection step. Just component-wise, positive part. And you do like that if the constraint is So you do the exact same thing that you know how to do in gradient method, which this would have to be a, a projection. So I would just be projecting onto the constraint set in the dual. So those constraints, if I wrote them down in such a way that it enabled me to derive the dual, they would imply maybe something about the domain of the dual variable, and I would have to do projection. There's a really neat interpretation of this. I think that um, this decomposed uh, dual approach to this problem has a really neat interpretation that I, I, I grabbed from Levin Vandenberg's lecture notes. And it's a price coordination interpretation. 
Um, and this, this language may make sense to you if you come from an operations research background. I thought it was kind of neat. I hadn't thought about it in this way before. Um, let's suppose we have B units in a system. So that's what each of these blocks represents. We have some, some system, and each of these sub-blocks, xi, represents one of the units. And it's kind of like the decision variable. Suppose uh, it tells us how much, um, how, many, how, how much of some allocation of goods that we want to make for that particular unit. Okay, and each, uh, each element of A tells you about something about constraints on shared resources. So I'm looking at xi across all of my units. And let's suppose I want to allocate you know, so much of xi, but then I have some resources that all these are sharing. And so this tells you that globally, across all my allocations, I can't go over budget for some resources, each row being a different resource. Okay, and the budget for each particular resource is given by an element of, of b. In that setup, I can think about actually my dual variables. Remember, my dual variables here correspond to columns of A. Dual variables are prices on each resource. So if, if uh, each xi here were a scalar, then each u, uj is a scalar. It's just the price of a particular res resource. So uh, the dual update I can write as in succinct form as just taking the previous dual variable and subtracting off t times sj, where this sj is going to be the negative gradient. Negative gradient. Oops, I went for one slide. It's the negative gradient. So it's a negative of this. And after I form that, that uh, temporary dual variable, I have to actually threshold all of the negatives to 0. So that's a succinct way of writing the dual update. Uj plus, the next iteration is uj minus t times sj, where these sj are residuals. So they're how much resource they have left over after I make certain allocations. Okay, B minus the sum of AI XI. How do I interpret this? Well, um, if resource J is overutilized, which means that SJ is less than zero, so I've used up more of resource J than I'm allowed to because SJ in the Jth component is negative, then I'm going to increase the price. See, I'm going to be subtracting off some constant times sj. The price is going to go up, subtracting off something negative. If my resource is underutilized, which means that actually there's something left over, b minus the sum of aixi is positive, then I'm going to be subtracting off something positive. So uj is going to, plus is going to get smaller. So I'm going to drive the price down. And this is just saying, this plus here is saying I should never let the prices get negative. Right, any particular price can't be negative. So I think it's a very neat um, price coordination interpretation of what, of what the dual gradient method is doing. Okay, and a lot of people, I think, uh, from an operations research background, say, or econometrics background, this is a very natural interpretation to them. So let me pause. Let me pause for questions about dual decomposability or dual gradient methods, because we're going to move on to uh, Augmented Lagrangians, if there's no questions. Yeah? Can you explain why the dual variable represents prices? Um, so th that's a very common interpretation in, in some uh, understandings of duality. But I think the best way to think about it is just um, through this relationship. Right? So. Or it, another way to think about it is, is actually through something like this relationship. I'm charging a price to every particular column of A. I'm trying to minimize some utility, or not uh, maybe maximize some utility. If I were to change this around, if fi represents utility, and then I'm incorporating the price through this linear combination of U and the columns of A. I think it's, it's, a, it's a loose analogy, I mean, but it, it is one that is quite common from, in some kind of uh, understandings of duality. 
we don't tend to think about that way in, in statistics and machine learning, I don't think. Um, we think about duality from maybe from the perspective that we've studied so far, but um, you'll even see uh, dual variables be, being called shadow prices in some literature and operations research or in econometrics. Question, yeah. This one? Uh, yes. How? Right, because, because AX equals B, and you can separate the X into blocks, and the A matrix A also separate into blocks, and you can have a bunch of uh, equality constraints, which is independent. They are independent. I think, I think you're they're thinking about separability in, in maybe the opposite way. So I have AX equals B. That is the same as A1, X1 plus a, B, X, B equals B. So that doesn't separate. Oh, I thought it's A, I, X, I equals B, I. Sorry. No, so, so these A, th these are columns of, the, you can think of these as of columns of X or sub-blocks of columns of X. So what you're thinking of is something like this for all rows. But that's still not the same. I mean, these are different statements. Okay, so even though I've decomposed x across across blocks, the primal equality constraint is not decomposable. Well, the primal gradient is that if you have a convex, uh, strong convex constraint, you get like one over epsilon convex straight. If you have a Lipschitz. Yes, we, we, we covered that. If you just have Lipschitz, it's still one over epsilon. That was the very first thing we proved. Lipschitz gradient, if you, as long as you choose the step sizes to be one over less than or equal to one of the Lipschitz constant, you have, lot, you have a one over epsilon convergence rate. That was, I think, our first proof in class. Other questions? Yeah. For this stuff? Yeah. So yeah, the, I, I was kind of being not very precise about saying gradient or subgradient, but this is, it's all the same. So just the only difference is whether or not that argument is unique. If it's not unique, then, you're, then you are running the subgradient method. If, you're, if it's unique, you're running gradient descent. Other questions? No? Okay, let's, let's take a break, and then we'll come back and do augmented Lagrangians.